It struck me as being a parable that was the heart of the whole New Testament. I read it and thought I could uh, write a, a parable uh, on that plan. And I did write one <coughs> on some wrapping paper with a stub of a pencil and I didn't do any punctuating because I didn't know any. And I didn't do much spelling except very little words. And I wrote it out with a pencil and I took it up and let the warden read it. It's way back in 1926. And he let me send that out just that way. And you'd be surprised, uh, an editor on Detective Story magazine bought it. Fixed it all up and published it. And she was a wonderful woman, had a spiritual center and said she would take everything I could write if I could do it that well. <laughs> I suppose they had people there who knew how to fix it up. And uh, then uh, I did several of these short shorts and sold them to uh, syndicates for these bi-weekly and twice-weekly newspapers as pillars. And I accumulated quite a little sum on that. And then someone got the idea of sending me some rehabilitation friend, of sending me the Palmer Institute of Authorship course. I studied that and then couldn't sell anything after that. Uh, I should have stayed with my parable of the prodigal son. <laughs> and uh, anyway, that's the going home parable always. I found a lot of things in it. Glenn Clark used to say he was the elder brother because he, he was an elder in the Presbyterian church and that I was the prodigal and he would always give a talk on that. <laughs> We had a great time with that parable. <clears throat> During the Depression, I got married and had a hard time economically making a living. Uh, so I went to writing again, these fillers for newspapers. And then I got into the greeting card business. And I got to writing those, and you have to write an awful lot of them. You can't make a, any kind of a living at it unless you have at least 30 sets of these cards <coughs> in the mail all, <coughs> all the time. And so I got so busy with that, I forgot to pray. Lost all track of the spiritual life altogether. And I just kept plowing away at these short, short stories and these greeting cards. You have to send them out ten in a group and then the companies pick out what they want if they want any and buy it. I always tried to write a Christmas card that I liked, <coughs> but I never, <coughs> I never could write one that satisfied me because they were all rather trite, and I've been unable to find a card that I like on the stands Christmas time. And I got here and I found one, in fact, Bernie Gale sent me uh, one a couple of years ago or a year or so ago that I greatly appreciate. It's a, it's a subjective card, it's a parable. Uh, that one there, and I want to, I want to get a lot of those and uh, save them up for Christmas and send them out. That is a great parable there, and I believe that uh, Hallmark, 
I think the man at the head of that Hallmark company uh, is a spiritual man. He, uh, at least he offered to put a great deal of money behind Frank Laubach in his literacy campaigns. And I wouldn't be surprised if he wouldn't uh, print this and distribute it. I wish he would. Well, to get back to this parable, one thing I've discovered in it is uh, seven laws of mental prayer. That's meditation. And I've also discovered something in it that's subjective. Uh, I think I want to mention that first. Uh, of course, it's speculation. But Einstein's field of matter, he has a descent, starting with gravity. And Glenn Clark says the uh, laboratory is here and the library is here. Here is science and over here is art. And he used to use this, uh, Einstein's field of matter. And then he'd cross over and he would ascend uh, from matter right on up to union with God. And the wonderful, uh, he used to illustrate it on the blackboard. Einstein would start with gravity <coughs> and then the frequency would go down and it would descend into magnetism. And then uh, in the plan of nature, the cosmos, this magnetism would descend into electricity. And then it would descend, it's getting lower, these vibrations and frequencies all the time. It would descend into heat. And it would then descend into uh, sound. And I think finally into matter. And matter would be the lowest form of it. Now you take that over in the parable of the prodigal son, and somehow or other the uh, all spirit, not the personal Holy Spirit, as we have him now, but the great general all spirit that existed before Jesus was born and inspired the prophets. <coughs> Uh, as it were, must have pinched off a little piece of this all spirit, and it became a spark, a little piece of fire. And uh, this descended then into soul, and soul became the vehicle for this spirit, personal spirit. And then the soul descended into ego, uh, getting down lower now, but it's the same principle. And Glenn used to quote, as below, so above, and as above, so below. So if this field of matter here in Einstein is true, then it's also true spiritually. And so <clears throat> the soul would become the uh, vehicle of this spirit, personal spirit, and uh, the ego would become the vehicle of the soul. Then the ego would descend into mind, and the vibrations and frequency are getting very low now. And the mind would descend then into emotion. And now it's so low that it's unreliable. Well, there isn't anything more unreliable and more unstable uh, than emotion. Everything that's decided on emotion is likely to fail you. You can be up uh, way up in uh, high heavens in emotion one minute, and the next minute it'll hurl you into the valley, the valley of despair. You can't, uh, can't trust it. And the emotion then would descend into a pattern. 
And that is etheric form upon which everything is built that is material. And this form then would descend into body. Now that spark of fire that's way up there, light, that started out is now down in the body and the parable calls this the pigsty. <clears throat> And it says, this light shines in this darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it, and the darkness cannot put it out. So this personal spirit, this light, this spark of God, is right here in the body, and the body can in no wise put it out, but it shines on in the darkness, and it's up to us after the spirit, the personal spirit has made this descent, it's up to us to go back. Uh, as Glenn would in his ark, go back up to you. And so there are seven laws of prayer here that show us how to do that. We have to go back to the Father, or the beginning. Now the first step in these seven laws of prayer is disillusionment, and this is the hardest one of all. Because more people are hurled off the spiritual plane and gotten out of tune with God because of disillusionment than any other thing. Uh, Jesus himself tried to disillusion people and get them to take this step. Somebody called him good. And he said, get up off of your knees and don't call me good. There's none good but the Father. But the person wouldn't be disillusioned. We get disillusioned in each other, and we can mope around for months and years in that disillusionment, uh, blaming this person for letting us die. Uh, whenever we get into a spiritual crisis, a real spiritual crisis like Gethsemane, uh, we become disillusioned in the world. We realize that the world has no answer, and it doesn't. In none of its departments does it have an answer. It has no answer to crime. It has no answer to anything that is beyond our will capacity to solve. And so this prodigal came down through riotous living on the left-hand side of that ark, and he spent all of his money, wasted his substance, and the first prayer he said was, give me. Now, God will, uh, will answer a give me prayer, even though it takes you to hell. Uh, if you have faith, and you say, give me, he'll give it to you and let you uh, go ahead and let out rope or drag anchor. And so he, knowing in advance exactly that this boy was going to hell, give me my portion of goods, and the father knew exactly what he was going to do. He was going to descend clear into this pigsty. And so he answered his prayer, and he gave him his substance that he wanted, and he descended down into the pigsty, and he was working for a foreigner, a man who raised pigs, and an Israelite can't have anything to do with pigs. He couldn't even eat the pigs, he couldn't eat the pork. And there he was working for a farmer who was raising these pigs and commercializing them. And they were disgusting to this Israelite boy. So he fain would have fed his, himself on the husks that the pigs did eat. And no man gave unto him. And so he was completely and totally disillusioned with the world 
There wasn't anything in the world, nothing under the sun that could help him. And he made the first step in prayer. And the next step was awakenment. It says he came to himself. When we wake up, we come to ourselves and we, we've taken a step, a long step, inadequate and uh, powerful and successful praying. And his next step was acknowledgement. The first thing to do about God is to recognize him and the second thing is to realize him. And the two great scriptures for this, of course, are the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer. Both start out by a recognition of God and both end with a realization of God. That is an experience. 23rd Psalm starts out with a recognition, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it ends with realization. And now I shall be with the Lord forever. He realizes God. He experiences it. And so it is with this parable. He acknowledges, he recognizes that he has a father. Comes to, he wakes up and, uh, and remembers this. He has a father and his father has bread and despair. And here I am in want. And so he makes the next step, repentance. There's no use to pray unless you're going to have repentance in it. And there's not much use to pray unless you're going to have good, earnest, sincere confession in it. But at any rate, repentance. And so he makes up a very beautiful little repentance speech. It's a wonderful thing. It's a kind of a classic uh, speech of repentance. And so he makes it up and commits it to memory. He says, I will go to my father. He takes the next step. He decides. Decision. I will go to my father and I will say to him, I have sinned against heaven and earth, and in thy sight, and I am no longer to be worthy to be called thy son. And then he says this great prayer. He passes from give me to make me. Two great prayers. And God answers both. He answers the one that brings him to destruction, and he answers the one that's going to take him right back to the kingdom. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son, so make me one of thy hired servants. That's his repentance speech. But he didn't get to say it. Half the time we don't get to say it. All we need to do is to have it in our heart. We don't even have to put it in words like he did and memorize it. If we've got it in our heart, that's, uh, the Father knows that. And so he got there and started to say uh, uh, verbally, to tell the Father verbally what he already knew. And the Father threw his arms around him and didn't permit him to put that repentance speech into words. Well, suppose you had a speech made up and you had committed it to memory and you wanted to say it. Then they wouldn't let you say it. You'd feel pretty badly about it, wouldn't you? Roland Brown made up a sermon. Uh, he was going to have 28 members from a church that had gone out of business, and the uh, flock was looking for a new uh, church home, and Roland knew that 20 of them were coming to hear his sermon one morning. He knew just when they were coming. 
And he spent a lot of time uh, comp uh, composing that sermon. He committed it to memory. He had all the gestures perfect and all the accents and inflections. He gave it to Lake Michigan several times. And he gave it in the looking glass a number of times. And he went out to the sand dunes and gave it to the sand dunes and the trees. So it was perfect. Then when he came out to give it, <clears throat> he was at his best in eloquence. And he rose to a high pitch of eloquence. And then a great big woman with a great big overcoat on got up out of the congregation, stomped over everybody's feet, and uh, went, he thought she was going out, she'd been offended or something, and instead of that, she went forward. Well, Roland had never had an altar call, I don't suppose, and he wondered why she was coming forward, but she was coming forward, and she reached in and began to stick the offering. It was on the communion table began to reach in and take it out of the plates and stick it in her big overcoat pockets. And Roland became paralyzed. He leaned over. Well, you can imagine what he thought when that offering was going the way of it. <laughs> and his sermon petered out. And he just stood there and, and watched that woman grabbing up the offering. And she must have been a student of Paul, for after she got through <coughs> stuffing her pockets full of the offering, why, she picked up a basket of flowers and threw it at the choir. And she said, how dare you women be in here with your hats off? <laughs> By this time, a man came to himself up in the choir and came down and laid hold on her, and she roughed his shins up plenty. <laughs> then another man came to the rescue, and they went dragging her out. Well, Roland was still paralyzed. Finally, he came to himself. He woke up. And he said when he woke up, his mind went back over a chasm of 2,000 years nearly. And it came to rest in a little synagogue back there in Palestine or somewhere, Jerusalem. And Jesus had the same situation to contend with. Only this man uh, disturbed the congregation in a different way. And Jesus said to him, he said to the uh, demon within him, he told the demon to come out of him and leave him alone. And the demon came out and left him alone, and he sat down and went through the service. And Roland said, you people bow your heads and let us pray. There's some kind of a demon, a, a fixation of some kind, some kind of an abnormality that has laid hold of this dear soul. And uh, you bow your heads in prayer and we'll cast it out. And they bowed their heads in prayer and he said, uh, he said to the Lord, uh, Lord, whatever it is disturbing this woman, uh, cast it out. By this time, they were out on the walk, and she came to herself. And she asked these two men what, where she was. And they said, well, you're at church. And uh, they told her what she had done. And she was embarrassed and ashamed. And they asked her if she wanted to go back and attend the service. She said yes. And she went back and went through the service, and Roland and Marcia took her home. Next day, Roland took her to the Elgin Hospital in Illinois, and mental hospital. 
and he stayed with her there for, he'd go nearly every day. <clears throat> Roland had also not only been trained in theology, but also he was a fine psychologist, had been trained in that and majored in it. And so he knew that the woman had a guilt, and he kept going trying to get to that guilt. And strangely enough, people who have guilt will often protect it. They get married to it. It's about the only thing some of them have to hang on to. And so there are people who will hang on to a sense of guilt for a lifetime. And they'll spend $20 an hour to psychiatrists to help them. And when the psychiatrist gets close to this guilt, they begin to protect it. And they can't get it. They don't want it, and they do want it. And so it was with this woman. Every psychiatrist knows that nearly 99 people out of 100 that come to him are coming because of a sense of unsublimated or unredeemed guilt. That's the one thing they uh, seek, and uh, nearly all of them find it is very difficult to get to this. Sometimes it takes a year. Uh, some psychiatrists have told me they've been two years before they could ever get uh, the patient uh, to let them in to get a hold of this. <clears throat> well, she uh, finally broke down and let Roland get that guilt. She was up in her probably 50 years old, and she had had that guilt from the time she was 16. And she had uh, done something uh, that was seriously wrong and in violation of her religious beliefs. And after he got it, he just said to her, uh, he just made a parable out of it, a symbol. And he said, now I'm going to reach in there with my hands and get a hold of that guilt, and I'm going to pull it out. And the Holy Spirit is going to bring all the roots of it out. As I pull the guilt out, the Holy Spirit will go down in your subconscious there and get on, gather up all those roots. And we just pull that out and throw it out the window. And she was heat as soon as she got rid of the guilt. And so it is that this parable tells us all about these things. Repent. Wake up. Awaken. Be disillusioned. Doesn't make any difference. Make a decision. And then the next step is to act upon that decision. He made the decision to go to the Father, repent, and he acted upon it. We make lots of decisions and resolutions, and then we don't act upon them. Uh, I never make any resolutions because I know they won't be kept. <clears throat> but decisions, yes, make decisions. Then if we act upon them, the chances are very good that they'll be kept. And the last step in this prayer process was attainment. He came from recognition. My father has bread and despair. The realization when the father threw his arms around him, took him on home. After he got there, he gave him four great gifts. He didn't tell him to get a new robe, just to drag the old rag back. And the first gift he gave him was a new robe. And to me, that means a new life. Brand new life. Gave him that. And then he gave him a ring to put on his finger. And that ring is a symbol of God, without beginning and without end, Alpha and Omega. No beginning and no end. And it also means union. That symbol has come down across the ages and still being used in marriage ceremonies. When we get married, we use a ring, round. And it means union. And we put that on the bride's finger. And that means that what's consummated in heaven cannot be 
put asunder what God has approved here in this. You put this ring on. Let no man on earth put this marriage asunder. And so he put that on his son's finger, uh, which meant that he would be in union with him forever, that he was safe now. And he gave him a pair of sandals, and that meant that he would be guided divinely. He would have understanding and guidance throughout all eternity. And finally, the fatted calf, which is a symbol of life and life abundant. He would never be in want anymore. So it is, we're going home now, <clears throat> just like that prodigal. And it's all a question of what we're going to do after we get there. And of course, we're going to run into all of the difficulties uh, that the world can heap upon us. And uh, we may get so busy with everything that we forget to pray just like I did. Back there in that depression when it was very difficult to make a living, 1932, uh, I got into this writing, these greeting cards and these short, short stories. And you'd have to hack out a lot of them in order to make anything. The most you could get out of one of these pieces would be five dollars, and you'd only get 25 cents a line for these greeting card verses. So you'd have to have a lot of them in the mail all the time. And you'd have to work very hard. Many times I'd turn out as many as five or six of these short, short things for newspapers in a day, and some of them would sell and some wouldn't. Maybe only one would sell. But the thing is that in being occupied all the time uh, with this trying to make a living this way, I was forgetting about the spiritual side. And I finally came to myself and I got a, an orange crate and an old seat that used to be in those old Model T Fords. And I went up on a little hill and uh, sat under a fig tree with a black cat around my shoulder. And I wrote, uh, in seven days, love can open prison doors. Uh, chapter a day. I think it was seven chapters I had <clears throat> at first, and I added one later. Well, I'd been working with Jim Tully with uh, writing some articles for Mercury magazine, H.L. Mencken's, and that was a cynical, skeptical sort of a magazine. But I needed the money. And so I collaborated with him. And uh, there was a, another young fellow who was writing then, became very brilliant. He was working in a bakery at that time, and he was writing. He became very famous. I guess Wrigley, the, the chewing gum man, paid him as much as a million dollars for a series of television and, or movie, movies and uh, stories, serials. And they told me, when I wrote that, and I had them read it, they said, for God's sake, don't publish that thing. If you go into that kind of religious writing, you'll starve to death because nobody will pay for it. Can't make a living at it. And so I said, well, I, I've got to get back. And the only way I know is this surgery. So I'm going to, I'm going to take hold of this thing and publish it. And that finally came out in 19, early part of 1934. And it stayed in print until this year. 
That's a long time. Uh, prison wardens, uh, penologists, and uh, criminologists, and uh, people who are connected with prisons and the operation and administration of prisons tell me that that book has helped more prisoners than any book that's ever been in their libraries. I think it's in every prison in the United States, probably it is. Many copies in some of them. Uh, the U.S. government bought 250 copies of it years ago. It's in their prisons. And the labor government in England, for the first time in the history of British, the British prison system, the labor government uh, bought 500 copies of it and distributed it in their prisons. It had opened the doors to prisons for me all over the country, and the last to open were federal prisons. They've had an ironclad rule against ex-convicts speaking in their prisons, but two years ago I spoke at the federal prison at McNeil Island, and they're opened up now, and they have established there the Catholic chaplain and the Protestant chaplain have established a, a series of wonderful things, workshops, and uh, one man there that I've been corresponding with ever since I started the uh, a penal newspaper, kind of a little magazine type of paper, and it keeps getting better and better all the time. So I realize that if we let anything else crowd in so much that it uh, removes from us what uh, Kermit was telling us this morning, keep your quiet hour. If we get to the place where day follows day and day follows day and we never pick up the scripture, we never, we never get still, we never withdraw from the world, never have prayer, our spiritual life simply dies and fades out. And in going home, I think we ought to go with the decision not only to have the quiet time but to act upon it. Now I believe we're going into some uh, sharing.